Now, here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here uh, with theCUBE. We're at a really special uh, presentation. We're at, at Santa Clara, California, the R&V building, Robert Noyce building, headquarters of Intel, uh, in the Intel Museum, a really great location to interview um, someone I've been trying to get on theCUBE now for months and months and months. We finally got on the calendar, so Leslie Berlin, welcome. Thanks. Leslie is a historian at Stanford. Um, she's been studying Silicon Valley as part of her PhD work, and she wrote a really terrific book called The Man Behind the Microchip, uh, the story of Robert Noyce. And Robert Noyce is probably, of the three kind of guys we think about that founded Intel, he's the one that unfortunately passed away early, and, and we don't know as much about him, I think, as most people do. So I wanted to get Leslie on, terrific book, uh, and talk a little bit about Mr. Robert Noyce, because we're in R&B. Right. So uh, it's awesome. So we all know about Andy Grove, right? Only the paranoid survive, and we all know about Gordon Moore and, and Moore's Law, but we don't know about Robert Noyce. What should people know about Robert Noyce? Who was he? Give us kind of a little background. So my favorite little soundbite about Noyce was that he was called the Thomas Edison and the Henry Ford of Silicon Valley, sort of a twofer in one guy. Um, and that's because he both invented one of the most important technologies in the valley, which was the integrated circuit, which lies at the heart of all modern electronics, better known as the microchip. Um, and he also started two of the most important companies in Silicon Valley history. The first one was Fairchild Semiconductor, which is really the first successful silicon company in Silicon Valley. It's, it is what made, this, made silicon work in Silicon Valley. And then the second uh, was Intel, which Nothing more needs to be said. We're right, right here right. and look at it. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting. It is that he created the silicon that created Silicon Valley. And as you talk about in your book, you know, Silicon Valley used to be uh, agricultural. It used to be apricots and peaches and and really a big fruit, uh, big fruit growing region. And he really changed that with with what he did. And, and what's interesting to me too is a lot of the characteristics of Robert Noyce, both as an inventor as well as a businessman. Uh, as an adventurer, as a risk taker, really define and continue to, to define what Silicon Valley is today. And a lot of the leaders that followed after him, I know he had a lot of influence on people like Jobs and others. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the personality, you know, kind of behind the man. Right, so um, I think the sort of first thing Noyce would do if he heard us having this conversation right now is he'd say, whoa, 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 I, I didn't do all that by myself. He would be the first person to tell you that he was a team player from the very beginning. So he's actually considered the co-inventor of the integrated circuit. Um, but he, what he did to sort of make it possible to layer on top of a silicon wafer was only one step in what needed to happen to actually finally get uh, to where we are now, obviously. Um, in addition, when he started Fairchild Semiconductor, he was one of eight founders of that company, and we can talk about that in a second. And then here at Intel, he co-founded Intel with Gordon Moore. He didn't do that by himself. And of course, Andy Grove came on very quickly. Les Videz came on very quickly. Um, and so the whole way through, he's always been a, a team player. And I think that really, that aspect of his personality is very important for understanding how Silicon Valley works and how high-tech innovation in general works. You don't, we all have this idea of sort of the mad scientist in his, with his white lab coat and the hair. I mean, no one who knows what they're talking about has that idea, but that's the image we still have in our minds of inventors. And it's really very much of a, of a team effort. So that would be the first thing I'd say about Noyce's personality. Um, the second thing I'd say is that he was this very unusual combination of sort of an ex extreme risk taker and very, very humble. He was the son of a preacher and the grandson of two preachers. He grew up in the middle of Iowa. He, um, he, he liked to be seen. He um, was a champion diver. He, was, uh, he sang in um, madrigal groups for his entire, actually all the way through. Um, which I think is also interesting. Madrigals is a type of singing where all the voices uh, blend together. And it, again, one of these sort of team approaches. Um, he, and he never was above sort of showing off at one of the many parties that defined early um, Silicon Valley culture. Uh, but he was always very humble. Um, at the same time, he was a huge risk taker from the time that he was a young boy and decided to 
build a boy-sized glider, pulling together everyone in the neighborhood, taking it to the roof of a barn behind his house, and running right off the edge of the roof, standing <laughs> inside this glider. And from that very moment, through everything he did, both uh, technically and entrepreneurially, he really was, um, he, he basically never saw an idea he didn't like. And part of what um, made the team approach, particularly here at Intel, so important um, for him was that he was someone who just, I mean, ideas just sort of fell off this guy. He was, he was in, I, he could have been inspired by a doorknob. And, um, but he didn't have anything really in the way of a, of a filter. Um, and Gordon Moore was this incredible filter who worked right next to him and was able to say, nope, 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 nope. Inter you know, how about that one? Let's try that one. Um, and that made for a great partnership. Um, the other thing uh, about Noyce, we really like to think of uh, our sort of these, these, these founders who develop this, these sort of big stories around them because it's interesting you say that maybe Noyce wasn't as well known as um, Moore and Grove. Noyce was the rock star of Silicon Valley in the 1980s. I mean, he, it, to say he was on the scale that Steve Jobs was is not quite fair because because electronics hadn't filtered down to consumers yet. So, um, but to the extent that there was someone who was seen as sort of the face and the incarnation of a Silicon Valley spirit, that was absolutely um, Bob Noyce. And so we like to think of these people as almost infallible, um, but Noyce would be the first to tell you that he was not a good manager at all. His nickname was Dr. Nice. He hated for people to be angry at him. He hated confrontation. And um, he, uh, when they started Fairchild in uh, 1957, this company grew to be one of the fastest growing, most successful companies um, up to date. And then it all fell apart. It completely fell apart. And there were a lot of reasons it did, but Noyce was pointed out in a letter that he wrote when he resigned from Fairchild that he had to bear some of the blame. And one of the reasons that he did was that um, he just trusted that he had hired very smart people and they were going to do what they said. He realized he needed someone who would come around and make sure they did what they said, and that was Andy Grove, who Noyce called the whip. And um, <laughs> this made them an incredibly powerful team. Um, so I realize that's a theme I keep coming back to, but no, it's, it's, it's an a, important it's, one. It's an important one, and, and, and you combine that teamwork with this, this kind of phenomenon of being part of a bigger company, and, and you talk about in your book, you know, when you went to, to Shockley, and Shockley was a legend in, in the business, to then leave that and start at Fairchild, which was just not done back in mm -hmm. the day, and, and what a unique concept that was, and then the difficulty they had in getting people to come to Silicon Valley, I love your explanation of the shot with, with the umbrella, that it was their Christmas shot, come, come to the valley, it's beautiful weather, um, good schools, and affordable housing, which is right. a great little plug. But it does take a special team, and it's, it's funny you talk about um, Andy being kind of the taskmaster. I remember when I came to Intel, it was famous for Andy standing outside, and you better be through those doors at 8 a.m., because meetings here start at 8 a.m. So it does take a, a combination, and the fact that he appreciated that to build something as big as Intel after Fairchild you know, didn't uh, or wasn't as successful as he wanted really is a good statement. Well, and he also really recognized his limits, by which I mean he knew he was great at starting things. He knew he was great at, at inspiring people, getting things off the ground. He moved out of uh, the executive suite and into the chairmanship of the board when Intel was only six years old. So he really recognized where he was good and ha the sort of long-term vision that he could provide. I love your point about Silicon Valley having been just the boonies back in the day. I mean, that's absolutely right. Everything of interest that was happening anywhere in electronics, when we're talking about, um, so, so Fairchild's founded in 57, Noyce came in 56 to work for William Shockley. Um, and ev everything of interest in tech was still more or less happening, sort of take Bell Labs and sort of draw a couple circles around it. Um, right, right. And you had some interesting stuff happening in Southern California. But yeah, it was, um, it, they definitely were recruiting for a certain type of person. And they really benefited, um, as Silicon Valley has always benefited, from huge waves of migration. Um, back in Noyce's day, these were people coming from the rest of the United States 
to California. So you had something insane, like 100 people moving into Santa Clara County every hour for 20 years. I mean, the population of this place between, say, 1950 and 1970 went berserk. Um, but it's continued to have the real benefit of what I think of as a, a constant refresh button of new minds coming in, people wanting to be here. And now those people come from all over the world. And that is just an, ab it's an incalculably valuable part of not only Silicon Valley, but the entire American economy. So talk about kind of the Silicon Valley the myth, kind of what we think of as Silicon Valley, it's, it's way more than Silicon now. It's, it's not even really probably based in Santa Clara. The, 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 the center seems to kind of move up and down 101 depending on what's hot, you know, whether it's in Redwood City when Oracle was on a tear or up to San Mateo and Salesforce and kind of a software up to San Francisco around media, which really seems to be booming now. And then, of course, you have Google sitting right where Silicon Graphics was and Mountain View and all the activity. But talk about kind of the ethos of, of what makes Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. How much of that you know, kind of came from uh, early trendsetters like Noise? How, how much of it's real? How much of it's perception? And, right. and will it continue? Will it sustain? I mean, you're a historian and you're living in the middle of, of a relatively short historical period that, that you can actually talk to most of the principals. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's actually been a really wonderful part of having chosen um, this field, yeah. Uh, so I would say the essence of Silicon Valley has remained uh, the, the same in some sense, by which I mean this is a region that has reinvented itself decade after decade after decade. So if you were here in the 40s, um, particularly uh, during the war and immediately after because uh, one thing that people don't really necessarily know about Silicon Valley is how important the Department of Defense was in launching this area because the Department of Defense had deep pockets and would do anything um, during the war, but especially during the space race, right. anything to get uh, faster, cheaper, better payloads up heavier right. Um, into space, and so they 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 spent enormous amounts of money on uh, Silicon Valley technology at a time before there were venture capitalists. Before uh, they were a very important source of capital. But if you look back um, in the in the say 40s, people would have said, "Oh, Silicon Valley is all about instrumentation." You know, this this is the land of Hewlett Packard. Then you get into the 50s, you start seeing some semiconductors. In the 60s, it's really semiconductors. The 70s, well, now you're in consumer electronics. Here, you know, you have Atari, you have Apple. These start to be sort of the companies. Then, you, you know, you have the personal elec electronics revolution. You have biotech starting late 70s into the 80s, and it sort of seems like, well, maybe that's the way we're going to be going. And then you get into the, the whole sort of uh, web and, and web 2.0, and then, and then the bubble, and then it, it comes back. And this seems to be sort of the, the MO of the valley. And really, it's vital asset, if you think about it, there have been sort of regional economies. Uh, I mean, you know, go, go back to, to medieval Europe, you, you know, there's they're sort of the shoemaking town. There's, this has been going on forever. You've got Detroit here, you know, in the 50s. That was, that was a, a, a specific industrial economy. But what, what has made Silicon Valley absolutely unique in my mind is that what that economy is, what that industry is, has continued to morph again and again. For that, again, I give a lot of credit to um, two things. One, um, the existence of Moore's Law, which um, has been vitally important for making it possible to do more and more and more with electronics. Right. And two, these people coming in um, who have actually made Moore's Law happen. Moore's Law is not a law of nature. Moore's law is a, an agreement that we've all made among ourselves that it ought to be possible to double the rate of transistors, blah, 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 blah. Right. And then people say, well, this ought to be possible. Let's make it happen. And the, and the customers plan their next um, release around the assumption of these sorts of changes. And so it is a human construct. And so it's that combination of the technology and the people that have made it possible for the valley to reinvent itself, reinvent itself, and reinvent itself. Because people have been counting the valley out since, since the oil crisis in the 70s. And it's always been the same thing. It's too expensive. People's commutes are horrible. 
and uh, it's too crowded. These have been the reasons that Silicon Valley has going to die since the mid-1970s. <laughs> and um, the other thing that's really important when I'm talking about the changes in the Valley is that we've also seen it go from a manufacturing economy to, um, to basically a software economy and it, it, a thought economy. Right. Um, you've, you had in the beginning here, you know, Apple was building its computers here. Intel was building its chips here. There were factories. They, some of them were called fabs, but they were factories and there were factory workers and there were very good middle class jobs and it was a different type of economy than it is now. And again, it's, it's, the, func it's the valley's ability to just morph um, that to me has, has been unique and can be traced to the technology and the people. Because it's really this idea that there are no limits. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you summed it up as more laws, really a function of people deciding that there should be no limits. And it just continues to amaze me how the industries continue to shift, even outside of core technology. I mean, the latest examples being Tesla. It's a car manufacturer. They took over the manufacturing facility um, in Fremont from Toyota, who was making mm -hmm. trucks over there. Now they're making cars. Uber, which is a way too uh, cited example, but it's still the, a, a phenomenal example of who would ever think you could digitally transform the taxi industry of all things. And, and just, a, again, this phenomenal thing. And as you said, people continuing to build on the shoulders of others with open source, with and now an API economy, with cloud and mobile and social, it just continues to right continues to roll. So again, from a historian's perspective, we're running a little bit out of time. Just sitting at Stanford, which again, keeps these, keeps these people coming in through Stanford. The weather's too nice, they don't leave. Doesn't exactly happen at Penn. Right. Right. <laughs> um, what's next? What are you working on? What, what do you kind of see as, as the next big wave or what's kind of keeping your attention right now? Well, I have moved all the way into the early 1980s in my research. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I am fascinated um, by the 1970s, which is this time frame during which you have the birth, really in the space of eight years, you have the birth of five major industries in the space of basically eight miles here in the valley. And um, that's what I'm writing about now. And I'm, I'm we, very excited. When's it coming out? Okay, we have a day? Uh, Approximate day? I'm I won't hold you to it, I promise. Submitting the manuscript at the end of this year. Oh, awesome. So it'll, that'll be up to the publisher. All right. Well, Leslie, we'll uh, have to get you back on when that book gets out. We I won't. We won't. I can't believe your other book came out in 2006, but still go out and read it. It's a phenomenal book. It's a timeless piece about someone who's really important in Silicon Valley and what Silicon Valley means, much more than Silicon. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Leslie Berlin from Stanford, the author of The Man Behind the Microchip, a, a biography of Robert Noyce. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We are at R&B, Robert Noyce Building, Santa Clara, California. Thanks for watching.